Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so we welcome uh, all of you for joining for another global immuno talk. Um, we hope these uh, immuno talks are making your Wednesdays a little bit better. And um, today I'm here with, uh, as always, my friend and co-organizer, Carla Rodley, and another amazing speaker, Dr. Jason Sister from UCSF. So as always, we'd like to go uh, through the goals that we set for these global immuno talks. Uh, first, to benefit and inspire immunologists across the world in an egalitarian manner and also to increase opportunities for scientific learning without traveling. And to accomplish these goals, we make these talks accessible for free. Uh, we also record the talks and upload them in YouTube right after the live sessions in the channel Global Immuno Talks. So if you have not uh, yet done it, uh, please consider subscribing to this, this channel so you can receive a notification once the videos are uploaded. Uh, we also make uh, discussions and questions and answers via Twitter. And we can only do this uh, because of the generosity and uh, the greatness of the amazing speakers that we have lined up, the uh, past speakers, the future speakers, and our great speaker uh, today that will be introduced by Carla. Thank you, Elena. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. I am delighted to introduce our speaker today, Jason Sister, who is a Howard Hughes investigator and professor of microbiology and immunology at UCSF. Now, to me, Jason is the master of migration. And that I think is revealed by his fundamental scientific contributions and also by aspects of his personal life. So we know that the vast majority of immune cells uh, develop, get activated and function in different sites, in different organs. And so a fundamental key of immunology is how those cells move across those organs. And it's right there where Jason's work has been fundamental and has really shed light on our understanding on the migration of immune cells. And I think today we're going to learn more about that. Now, migration has also been a feature of Jason's life. As I understand, he was born in Australia in a cattle farm. I don't know if we'll hear more about that, but maybe it's there where he fell in love with biology. And so he pursued uh, his studies to start becoming a scientist at the University of Western Australia. And after that, he migrated to England, to Oxford, where he got his PhD with Alan Williams. And later he came to the United States, first to Stanford, where he did his postdoc with Chris uh, Goodnow, and finally joined UCSF as a faculty. Jason has received numerous awards based on his fundamental scientific contributions. I will not go into details about that. I am really looking forward to learning more about immune cell migration. And I think that we're up for a treat with his talk on cues, guiding and restraining B cell responses. So thank you, Jason, so much for accepting to be a global immune speaker. Thank you, Carla, um, for your very kind comments. And more importantly, really thank both of you for your pioneering work in organizing this global and eco-friendly all-inclusive seminar series. It's, it's really an honor to participate. Thank you so much. And as uh, we all know, we always like to have a question to get to know you better and get to learn from you uh, before you start your talk. So we were wondering if you could share what has been the most impactful or one of the most impactful decisions in your scientific career. Sure, I'll begin by saying that one's career path is, of course, the outcome of many important decisions. And the decisions I made to join the labs that you mentioned, Wayne Thomas in Perth, Alan Williams in Oxford, Chris Goodnow in Stanford, during my training were hugely impactful on my career. But to emphasize one decision, I'll point to the decision to join UCSF as a faculty member back in 1995, because this institution has been an unbelievably good place to do science. That decision led me to be surrounded by many brilliant and supportive colleagues to live in an amazing environment 
and to be part of an outstanding training community that attracts some of the best young students and postdocs in the country, giving me the incredible good fortune of working with these amazing trainees. And it's also an institution that cherishes diversity. So in terms of advice for any passionate, hardworking young immunologists who might be listening, I can of course say with confidence that joining UCSF would be a good decision. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. It's so true how our environments are so nurturing and so important to help us move science forward. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. We look forward to your talk. Let's okay, I'll go ahead and your screen. I screen up. If I can get the right piece. Okay, well, let's see. I'll get the. If you put it in presenter presentation mode. Thank you. Yes, that's no, hard. thank you again. And uh, I'll be talking on the cues, guiding, and restraining B cell responses. In the first part, I'll give a review of our work in this area, and then I'll focus in on our studies defining a new metabolite that is involved in guiding and restraining B cell responses. And then I'll finish with some new work regarding requirements for memory B cell generation. So to begin, it's important that we all appreciate that B cell responses for the most part take place inside peripheral lymphoid tissues, which in humans, there are about 500 lymph nodes about 100 pairs patches distributed along the small intestine, six tonsils in the oral and nasal regions, and of course, one spleen. And lymphocytes are continually surveying, traveling uh, in the circuitry system, entering into individual lymphoid tissues where they spend about a day surveying for antigen to see if they should mount a response. And if we zoom in within individual lymphoid tissues, we see that the lymphoid regions of the spleen, the splenic white pulp cords, uh, lymph nodes or mucosal lymphoid tissues have a similar overall design with B cell rich follicles and nearby T cell rich zones. And lymphocytes are continually coming in from the bloodstream and then traveling to their separate subcompartments. And the key difference between these tissues is the body fluid that they're sampling for antigen. The spleen sampling the blood for bloodborne pathogens, lymph nodes sampling lymph, which is coming from many body surfaces and the mucosal lymphoid tissue sampling the, the mucosal cavities. And these tissues are functioning then as hubs to bring cell and antigen together and promote the cell-cell interactions needed for adaptive immune responses. And, and we've been interested then for a long time in understanding the cues and organizing mechanisms that allow these crucial immune tissues to function. And, and some years ago, we and others identified a chemokine called CXL13 that acts on the receptor CXCF5 to attract B cells into follicles. And then chemokines uh, CCL19 and CCL21 act on CCR7 to guide cells into the T cell zone. And then a bioactive lipid, sphingosine 1-phosphate, is crucial in promoting exit from lymphoid tissues, whether into lymph from lymph nodes and mucosal tissues or into the blood, by engaging another chemoattractant receptor, S1PR1. And S1P is abundant in circuitry fluids and produced at egress sites and is critical for the lymphocytes to exit, including effector T cells. And we showed that this small molecule, FDY720, acts as a functional antagonist of S1PR1 and can inhibit e egress of effector T cells. And studies by many groups have shown that that can then prevent them from getting to sites of autoimmune inflammation. And that property it contributes to the activity of this small molecule as an effective immune suppressant to treat certain autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis. We've also been interested in the cues organizing more specialized compartments such as the marginal zone of the spleen, showing, for example, a role for a cannabinoid receptor. And in studies uh, over the last several years, we've characterized a role for a chemoattractant receptor called EBI2 or GPR183 that responds to a dihydroxylated form of cholesterol to promote positioning of cells, in this case, subsets of dendritic cells, activated B and T cells in a site that can augment certain antibody responses. And we've had an interest in cues involved in positioning of cells at barrier surfaces, such as the intestine. We've shown that GPR55, which can respond to another lipid, lysophosphatyl inositol, can influence the amount of interaction between intraepithelial lymphocytes and the epithelium. But what I want to focus on mostly today is our work regarding the germinal center that forms inside the lymphoid follicle during uh, an immune response. 
And we've shown some years ago that this structure is in part organized by the chemokine CXCO12 acting on CXCO4, as I'll come back to in a moment. To, to follow the dynamics of what's happening in these tissues where there's so much migration going on, we and others use intravital imaging, particularly two photon microscopy. We're here, we're looking at a segment of lymph node, looking through the capsule in this dark blue, we can see this lymph filled subcapsular sinus, and then we've labeled some of the stromal cells uh, green uh, in the follicle. And so this is playing back in minutes and seconds after vaccination. And we can see this red labeled antigen coming in to this sinus very rapidly. This animal was already um, immune competent. So this is effectively a secondary response. Immune complexes are forming as, and the particles are depositing over the follicle, allowing rapid access for B cells to encounter antigen. Over time, this material gets moved into the follicle and can become deposited on specialized stromal cells in the follo follicle center, the follicular dendritic cells, where it can be displayed in intact form for hours or, or days, allowing uh, ongoing B cells as they arrive to, to have a chance to encounter. And here we're looking at cognate B cells in green, encountering these red labeled antigens on the follicular dendritic cell and capturing that antigen for subsequent internalization, processing and presentation to T cells. And so those cells will then relocate to this follicle T zone interface, where initially the lymphocytes are moving in their separate subcompartments, B cells in red in the follicle, T cells in the T zone. But after antigen encounter, the cognate cells that are specific for the antigen at this interface can then enter into these prolonged conjugates where the T cell in green is attached to that B cell in red for periods sometimes as long as an hour, providing helper signals to the B cell. So focusing in on, on the germinal center, here we're looking uh, at a single germinal center that's formed inside a lymphoid follicle. So these structures are seeded oligoclonally by low affinity B cells. And then over a period of days, they organize into two zones with the dark zone being the site of germinal center cell proliferation and somatokite mutation of their immunoglobulin genes. And the light zone, the site where they can encounter antigen displayed on the follicular dendritic cell shown here in red and encounter helper T cells. And depending on the strength of the signals they receive, they may return to the dark zone for continued cycles of selection or exit as memory B cells or plasma cells. And some years ago when, when Chris Allen was in the lab, uh, we demonstrated that CXCR4 is crucial for cells to move from the light zone to the dark zone and that CXCR5 contributes to organization of the light zone. And then more recently, when Oliver Bernard and Lauren Rodel were in the lab, we characterized a CXCO12 producing population of stromal cells using the CXCO12 GFP reporter mice developed by Takashi Nagasawa. And we uh, termed these cells CXCO12 positive reticular cells because of their very extensive dendritic uh, network. In, in more recent work, uh, Lauren, Lauren Rota performed when she was in the lab, uh, single cell RNA sequencing on lymph node stromal cells. And then uh, more recently, Burkhard Ludwig's lab has performed also single cell RNA sequencing. We find that these cells have a very similar gene expression pattern to the follicular dendritic cells. And I think you can see that morphologically they do look rather similar. And so it, it's probably reasonable for these cells to be considered uh, FDC2. So we've been interested for some time in the selection events going on in the germinal center. And based on imaging work that Chris Allen and Taka Okada performed when they were in the lab, we favored a model of selection where B cells that received adequate BCR signal would then need to also uh, compete for T cell help. And um, with the view that the high affinity cells would be able to take up more antigen in a limited time window than intermediate affinity cells and thereby present more MHC peptide complexes to the limited number of available T cells in the germinal center and win out in receiving T cell help compared to intermediate affinity cells. And of course, this concept has been supported by many studies, particularly uh, the work of Victoria and Nussenzweig uh, demonstrating uh, examples of this. But we continue to wonder whether there are factors beyond MHC peptide abundance that determine the quality of the T cell help. And as one approach to look at that, we focused in on a molecule called HVAM because published studies had found that it was frequently mutated in germinal center derived lymphomas, suggesting to us that it may have a role in negatively regulating signaling uh, in the germinal center. So Shelley Mintz, who was an MSTP student in the lab and is now back in medical school, 
looked at this and found that HFEM in the, in the B cell was engaging one of its ligands, ETLA, that's highly expressed by follicular helper T cells in the germinal center. And together with work uh, in collaboration of James Felch and Mike Dustin, we could show that it was recruiting SHIP1. And then in genetic experiments, we could show that this was necessary for it to antagonize TCR signaling or diminish the signal and restrain the amount of preformed CD40 ligand that was delivered to the cell surface and therefore the amount of help that was provided. And so in an HFM deficient setting, this signal would be stronger, more CD40 ligand signal and, and probably other signals could then be delivered. And Shelley also performed a sequencing analysis of the B cell receptor in a model antigen response and found that the HFM deficient cells had a lower frequency of affinity improving mutations than the, um, than the wild type cells. And so this supports uh, a model where HFM BTLA SHIP1 negative signaling is important for germinal center B cell selection stringency. And, and this work also provided evidence that HFM may not be acting as a cell intrinsic tumor suppressor, and that rather that its loss is leading to a loss of this BTLA engagement and increased help driving the proliferative uh, process chronically in some conditions that contribute to lymphoma genesis, suggesting that BTLA is acting as a cell extrinsic tumor suppressor in this context. So I think this work tells us that there's certainly a lot more we need to learn about the signals uh, controlling the quality of the T cell help of the B cell response, and, and so lots more to do there. But what I wanna focus on for the main part of the talk is our interest in the organizing logic of the germinal center. And so here we're looking in at a lymph node cross-section from a human. And you can see that these germinal centers, these pale structures are uh, nicely separated from each other, effectively as islands. And it's thought that this is allowing uh, separate mutation programs to be going on in these separate islands, likely contributing to the overall diversification of the antigen specific response. And we can see that these um, structures are, are well confined or separated even though, of course, germinal center B cells are highly dynamic, surveying their environment for antigen, encounters with T cells, and of course, undergoing cell division and cell uh, death events as part of the selection process. But what I wanna highlight here is if we transfer in more of the, the red naive cells that are not involved in the response, we can see that they're, for the most part, well separated from the germinal center uh, without a, a physical barrier uh, involved. And so, we've been interested in how this confinement occurs. And, and to give some of the, the earlier background here, this is work uh, from when Jesse Green was in the lab and then developed by Jagan Mupiti, who's now got his own lab at the NIH. We found that germinal center cells highly express another S1P receptor called S1PR2. And in contrast to S1PR1, it's a chemoattractant receptor signaling through GFI. This couples to GF13, which directly engages a GEF for Rho and can inhibit cell migration. And so we found that when cells lacked S1PR2, rather than being tightly confined to the germinal center at the follicle center, there was some deconfinement, partial, but, but notable. And, and these arrows are indicating a decaying gradient of S1P from the outer to the center follicle. Now in the course of that work, uh, Jesse Green uh, observed when he aged some mice out for a year, the S1PR2 deficient mice and we subsequently also found GF13 deficient mice, about half the animals go on and develop a germinal center type lymphoma that looks like human GCB DLBCL, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And, and so this is a mesenteric lymph node from, from a, a wild type year old mouse. And this is a mesenteric lymph node from a GF13 deficient mice and a mouse, and, and these are to scale. And, and most of these accumulated cells are germinal center B cells. And so that observation led us to collaborate with Lou Stout at the NCI and, and discover that S1PR2 is uh, mutated in this uh, human lymphoma. And, and published work by, by others, and we could also see with Lou that GF13 is, is also mutated uh, in this lymphoma. So providing a pathway for what might be going on, and I'll, I'll highlight this is not only acting to restrain migration, but also other signaling uh, events, uh, including uh, inhibiting growth promoting pathways such as AKT, and that likely, the loss of that regulation likely contributes to lymphoma genesis. But what I want to emphasize today is the observation that we made in the course of this work that the GR for 13 deficiency in B cells led to a more severe deconfinement than the S1PR2 mutation. And so I'm thinking about why that might be. 
we considered that there may be another receptor acting upstream of GR-alpha-13, promoting the confinement and possibly also the growth regulation. And so in thinking about what that receptor might be, we looked at the human sequencing data for the, these lymphomas and noted that there was another G-protein coupled receptor called P2RY8 that was an orphan receptor, as in it didn't have a known ligand, that was actually more frequently mutated in this lymphoma class than S1PR2 itself. So we asked, does this receptor have the capacity to promote a confinement effect? And so we, we took the human receptor along with GFP and we, and we put it into mouse B cells and then we transferred them back into normal mice and looked at their distribution with respect to the endogenous B cells that are labeled blue in these spleen sections. And so if we just put in GFP, we can see the transferred cells distribute evenly amongst the endogenous B cells. But if we put in human p 2 oa 8 we can see this confinement effect to the center of the follicle where the, the germinal center would form. So to understand how this system was working and, and, and working together with the S1PR2 system, we realized we needed to know something about what the ligand for this receptor was. And so to, to do that, we, we set up a bioassay and this work was developed by a very talented uh, graduate student, Eric Liu, who, who graduated from lab last year. And he um, transduced a cell line with P2RY8, took very uh, high expressing cells and compared the behavior to the same cell lacking P2RY8 in migration to a chemokine alone, versus chemokine with an extract from a tissue of interest with the hypothesis being that the bioactive extract should inhibit selectively the migration of the P2O8 cells in the logic of a confinement effect. And so we worked through various tissues, starting with the tissues we expected to have activity and had negative results, but Eric pers persevered uh, and, and we got a glimmer of hope when he tested liver extract and saw that there was perhaps a twofold inhibition. So this is the migration of the P2O8 cells uh, to the chemokine alone. And we see that's about twofold reduced when liver extract was added with the chemokine. Eric then considered that the liver uh, extract would have contained bile, he, with the gallbladder was present. So he asked, well, maybe, maybe does bile have activity? And we were really uh, struck to find that the bile was actually a much more potent source uh, of activity. So that um, meant we had a positive assay. And so we said, well, can we see activity in other sites? In particular, do any cell lines make activity? And so we looked at um, supernatants from initially from a, a liver cell line, and it found that we could indeed detect inhibitory activity in the supernatant. I should say this is far less potent than with bile, uh, which we could dilute out many fold. This is undiluted, but, but the activity was there. And moreover, when we took supernatants from actually any adherent cell type, including a number of tumor lines, we could see that compared to this uh, migration to chemokine alone, they all had inhibitory activity on P2RY8, suggesting that the ligand might be quite broadly produced. And then in early work, Eric found that the activity could be extracted with methanol, suggesting it might be a, a small molecule, perhaps a lipid. And with that thought in mind, we asked, can we learn anything about this molecule by treating uh, the cell line, th this liver cell line with uh, inhibitors of lipid biosynthetic pathways to see if that caused a reduction in activity and so we can see that here's the, the inhibitory effect. And if we treat the cell line with uh, these inhibitors, there was no loss of that effect. However, treatment with statins completely uh, destroyed the activity, meaning the cells are no longer generating the inhibitory activity. Now, of course, statins are blocking the whole mevalonate biosynthetic uh, pathway. And so there are many downstream molecules and they modify the cell in many ways. But this was uh, at least very helpful in thinking about uh, what might be involved in ligand generation and something we were able to take advantage of. But we knew we had to set up a purification scheme. And so we began with bile since this was the most potent source and developed a purification strategy and then performed mass spectrum analysis. However, we anticipated that would yield many ions. And so um, Eric also worked through a purification scheme from the cell culture supernatant and performed comparative mass spec. But even then there were still many peaks in, in the spectra. So we then took advantage of this observation that statin treatment was removing the activity or preventing production of activity and um, pr performed a purification of the control supernatant and then the statin treated supernatant. So working blind here, but taking the equivalent fraction that was active over here and, and taking it through the same steps to then look to drop out uh, of particular ions. And so just to take you through a little of that, um, if we look uh, at the gallbladder in the mouse, we, we, we had estimated that we'd want at least 100 mils of bile of this kind of biochemical fractionation, probably more. Uh, and the, even on a way the mouse has maybe 30 microliters of bile in, in its gallbladder, 
So this was going to be a lot of mice even, even for us. So, so here is where um, we, we went, went to the farm, or in my case, we went back to the farm and, and tested bile from various uh, other larger species. And I should say, including humans here in the hospital at UCSF, although the human bile tended to be uh, rather difficult to work with, probably because it's full of gallstones. But we found uh, through these tests that the, the pig was an excellent source and we were able to get about a liter of bile for, for 100 bucks. So that was a good deal. And of course, in parallel, we were doing the more expensive uh, tissue culture of the cell line. And so um, Eric then worked up a seven step uh, purification strategy. I won't take you through uh, all of this, but to show you a little of, of the, the work, uh, here's the HPLC steps. And so he's uh, taken fractions off this C18 column and performed the migration assay looking for migration inhibition, and then taken the active fractions, pulled, concentrated, and, and run them on a second column of, of a different uh, chemistry to separate different species and then repeated that on a third type of column and then a fourth type of column, and then take that to our mass spec instrument uh, for analysis and, and repeat the entire process with the control and the statin treated culture supernatant. And so uh, after that, uh, he, we could then do these uh, comparative analyses. And so we can see here these various peaks in the MS analysis of the bile after the multiple steps purification and the cell culture supernatant, then we can see that there's actually quite a lot of shared peaks despite these quite different sources of material. But what was crucial was when we looked in the statin treated culture supernatant, while quite a few of the peaks were retained, there was this notable dropout of the 580.3. And so we then asked, what is the, um, can we get a high resolution mass of that um, peak? And, and so we found uh, using a different instrument that the mass was 580.3435 in positive iron mode. And so we then ran that against the public domain databases, which have over a million uh, metabolites in them, and uh, we got no match. So this was both a, a daunting uh, and an exciting uh, moment because uh, it meant we might have a new metabolite. And so Eric moved forward, uh, now performing MSMS -MS fragmentation to obtain a fingerprint uh, of the 580.3 uh, compound and, and could see a spectrum like this. And, and this is still very challenging then to, to know what to do next, but here we were able to take advantage of a modern tool of biochemistry, and that is the Google search. And so we could search the, these peaks to see if anyone had described them in other molecules, and we're uh, fortunate to find that there was a study describing the MSMS analysis of glutathione. And when we uh, look at that, we can see that it has a very similar uh, set of fragments to part of the 580.3 MSMS spectra. And so it looked like the molecule this, this compound contained glutathione was like their glutathione conjugate, then raising the question of what is the other half. And so if we subtract the weight of glutathione of 580.3435, we get 274.2674, which could correspond to C20H34 if we ignore some, uh, some atoms. And, but then you know, what is that? Uh, well, this is where we returned to our observation that the ligand production uh, was apparently statin sensitive and asked whether any of the molecules in the um, mevalonate pathway, only some of which is shown here, uh, might match that formula. And it turned out that one did, and that was geronyl geronyl. And so we uh, speculated that the ligand might be S geronyl geronyl L glutathione. And so Finn Wolfries in the lab went ahead and synthesized this uh, novel metabolite. And then Finn worked with Eric to test its activity on the transfected cells. And fortunately for us, we found that GGG was a potent nanomolar inhibitor of migration of cells bearing P2RY8, whereas glutathione or geronyl geronyl had no activity uh, in this assay. And this is just an example uh, of that data. Now, this is with a transfected cell line. Uh, what about on cells expressing endogenous amounts of receptor? So as I alluded to earlier, p 2 8 is highly expressed in germinal center B cells. And so we took human tonsil, which is rich in germinal center B cells, and, and we can see them here as CD38 positive IgD low, and they're migrating to CXCO12. But if we add in 10 nanomolar of uh, Finn's synthetic GGG, we can see a very strong inhibitory effect. And that's uh, the titration of that data shown here. Um, we also find that uh, T cells, that particularly the follicular helper T cells, highly express uh, P2RY8 and were also inhibited in their migration by GGG. In addition to inhibiting, um, well, like going back, I should say, although 
the bioassay didn't reveal GGG in lymphoid tissue, we can now return with an LC-MS-MS analysis and find that lymphoid tissues do have nanomolar amounts of uh, GGG present. And that uh, amounts uh, are in accord with the spinning nanomolar sensitive receptor. Why there's micromolar amounts in bile, uh, we, we still don't understand. But I'll also mention that GGG is also able to inhibit um, signaling pathways in germal center B cells such as AKT. So in thinking about the organization logic then, we, we think about a cell that's turned up high expression of P2IA, as is the case for a germal center cell, and that that's gonna promote this confinement effect. And that then relies on GGG being abundant in the outer follicle and low in the follicle center. Now, unfortunately, mass spec, spatial mass spec techniques don't allow us to readily go in and look for uh, nanomolar abundance of, of metabolites like this. So uh, as a surrogate, we look for the enzymes that might be involved in making and degrading uh, the metabolite and then look at their distribution. And so we made some inroads in looking at the enzymes that might be involved in degrading GGG by looking at this small class of gamma glutamyl transferases that uh, were known to be able to metabolize glutathione conjugates. And by testing them uh, in, in the bioassay, we found that GGT5 uh, seemed to be, is active on, on GGG. And so here it, we're using 293 cells that I mentioned earlier produce bioactivity. So they're able to uh, inhibit the migration of P2A to expressing cells to, um, to CXL12. But if they're transfected with GGT5, then the, we lose that inhibitory activity. And by mass spec analysis, the uh, expected cleavage of the gamma glutamyl bond by the uh, GDT5 enzyme was occurring, generating what was uh, an inactive metabolite on the receptor. Now, for this uh, system then to work, the hypothesis was that GT5 needed to be expressed at the follicle center to degrade GDG and make that a low point uh, in the gradient. And so uh, we were fortunate that there was an antibody uh, that worked for staining human GDT5 infections. And we were uh, indeed uh, able to find that the enzyme is expressed in a pattern very similar to a classic FDC marker, the complement receptor. Uh, so here in the germinal centers at the follicle center. And indeed, co-staining uh, confirmed that this expression is on the follicular dendritic cell. Uh, in, in the mouse, we don't have an antibody that, that works uh, for GT5, but we can look back at Lauren Roder's uh, um, stromal cell RNA-seq data, single cell RNA-seq data, where we'd seen that the FTC is a very distinct stromal subset uh, in the lymph node. And look at GT5, we can see that it is indeed enriched uh, in the FTC subset. So is GT5 involved in metabolizing GTG in vivo? And so as one way to look at that, we uh, asked, well, if we in increase the abundance of GT5 and no longer have it restricted to the follicle center on FTC, so, so uh, we overexpressed it in, in B cells and just put them into the animal to let them distribute. And so the hypothesis was that we would now start metabolizing the GGG inappropriately throughout the follicle. And we asked in that environment, can P2A8 function? And so we can see that when we put P2A8 into control animals, uh, sorry, put P2A8 overexpressing B cells into control animals, then they localize into the germal centers at the follicle center. And the germal centers are staying with this uh, red FTC marker. But if that uh, GT5 is widely distributed, then we can see that the P2 8 cells are failing to, to focus to the center, providing indication that, that this enzyme and GDG is important in controlling GDG distribution. So to um, provide a model for, for uh, this part, uh, I think we can say that germal center B cells are migrating actively in part in response to chemokines that are activating G alpha I coupled receptors, activating RAC, promoting actin polymerization and movement. And that movement will sometimes bring them to the perimeter of the germinal center where they start encountering higher amounts of GGG. That will then engage G alpha 13 uh, and that directly activates rho, this being at the leading edge of the migrating cell, counteracting the RAC activity and inhibiting migration in that direction, promoting a confinement effect. And in addition to this uh, confinement process, it's also restraining uh, growth promoting pathways such as AKT uh, so having other roles in, in constraining the germinal center response. Now, in addition to this pathway, uh, as I mentioned earlier, S1P and S1PR2 are doing a very similar thing. And so these systems are, are cooperating to promote human germinal center B cell confinement and, and, and growth constraint. And we know that they're not redundant because loss of either through mutation is frequent uh, in germinal center lymphomas, DLBCL and also Burkitt lymphoma. 
And so we think that somehow they're, they're cooperating to achieve a higher level of organization than we currently understand, and also possibly uh, restraining distinct pathways uh, for the different receptors that contribute to growth control. And then finally, I'll say that P28 is widely expressed by um, immune cells, not, not just uh, in the germinal center. Other B cells, T cells, NK cells, some myeloid cells express this receptor. And as I mentioned earlier, GGG uh, is produced by many cell types. So uh, I think we can anticipate that this system will have uh, other roles uh, in, in constraining the immune response. So I want to move on now to the last part of the talk, uh, immune memory. Um, and I think we, we, we all know immune memory is very important. And I think we're particularly aware of it at the moment in thinking about the um, huge amount of work that's going on to develop a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And we hope that not only will that be uh, very effective and protective, but that it will induce a durable, long-lasting immunity. And of course, we hope this for, for all uh, vaccine development. And so uh, humoral uh, memory uh, depends in part on memory B cells and they contribute by surviving for long periods and responding more rapidly upon uh, reinfection or if it's after vaccination upon first infection. And memory B cells often um, arise from germinal centers. Yet despite their importance, the factors that govern memory B cell differentiation are uh, incompletely understood. So as an entry point into thinking about this, we asked if we could identify the earliest germinal center B cells giving rise to memory B cells. And, and our entry into this actually came from our, our general interest in, in the surface molecules involved in organizing uh, immune cell interactions. And we'd found that a, a molecule called Ephraim B1, a neuronal uh, guidance molecule, was uh, quite selectively expressed in germinal center B cells in some microarray work we'd done. And indeed, when we look uh, at the peak of a germinal center response to sheep red blood cells, we can see strong expression on cells gated with conventional uh, germinal center markers. And if we stay in sections, then we see this very specific staining uh, amongst hematopoietic cells of, of the germinal center. And this was work uh, initially initiated by, by Jesse Green and Tim Schmidt were in, when they were in the lab, and then really developed by uh, Brian Laidlaw, a, a postdoctoral fellow. And, and I should say that, that um, Hai Chi's lab uh, in Xinhua, who spoke recently in the series, also uh, found Ephraim B1 present uh, on germinal center cells in the mouse. And so uh, Brian went, um, and, and looked at the response to uh, lymphocytic chorimeningitis virus, an RNA virus, focusing in again on this germinal center gate and found that it was only when the, the germinal center response re reached its, its peak, its most mature state, that most of the cells had become F from B1 positive, suggesting to us this is a mature germinal center marker, possibly a definitive germinal center marker in the mouse. And so uh, Brian asked if he could take advantage of that by seeing if we could then look for cells that were about to leave the germinal center as, as early memory cells. And in particular, we were thinking that as cells committed towards a memory fate, they would need to downregulate the confinement receptors we've just been talking about as they need to leave the germinal center. And so in particular, uh, we thought they might, uh, we, we looked at S1PR2 using uh, these S1PR2 venous mice, uh, kindly provided by Taka Okada in Japan. And, and memory B cells uh, are known to highly or upregulate CD38. And so focusing in on the F from B1 positive fraction, so this sort of definitive germinal center state, we were able to see that there were indeed uh, a small number of cells with a surface uh, phenotype of germinal center cells, but that were downregulating S1PR2 and upregulating CD38. And moreover, Brian found that these cells were somatically mutated, consistent with having been part of the germinal center response, but they also had uh, enhanced survival when incubated in vitro suggesting they may be taking on properties of memory. So he then performed population RNA-seq on that small subset and compared it with the germinal center compartment and also with the, the mature memory cells sorted with conventional markers. And indeed found that this pre-memory subset was uh, quite uh, sharing many gene expression uh, features with the memory state. So we then looked in um, to see what factors, or we'll start to think about what factors might be involved in generation of the memory state. And Brian looked at the transcription factors, particularly focusing on ones that were turned on already in this pre-memory state and sustained uh, into the memory compartment. And, and to then ask whether they might be involved in memory B cell differentiation. Now you can see this is still quite a, a long list of factors. And so Brian uh, developed a conditional in vivo transcription factor uh, CRISPR screen so he used Rosa Flox, stop Cas9 GFP mice, 
crossed with the C-gamma-1 uh, cream ice uh, from, from these sources, and then transduce that bone marrow with retroviral constructs with two guides uh, against each target with two different reporters to track them. We constituted mice, LCMB infected, and looked at the memory B cells at day 30. And, and so I'm not going to take you through all this gating scheme, but he's focusing in on GFP positive, Cas9 positive cells, and, and then looking at cells with both reporters that express both guides to the target, comparing their frequency in the memory compartment to the germinal center. And so if we look across all 19 transcription factors that he screened, we can see that most of them, when knocked down, are not impeding memory cell development. But importantly, two of them uh, were, were quite important. And those uh, were HX and TLE3. So focusing in uh, on HX, this is um, hematopoietically expressed homeobox protein. So it's a member of the homeobox family. Binds DNA via its homeo domain. It can repress or promote gene expression depending on context. And it's important in, in development uh, as in knockout mice die uh, embryonically. So we, we can see it's, it's organized into these domains with the homeo domain here in the middle. And so uh, Brian asked whether it was functioning as a transcription factor to promote memory B cell development by mutating this key DNA binding residue and then asking uh, its ability to promote memory formation. So here he's using a retroviral transduction approach, putting in more wild type HX was sufficient to promote memory. But if he mutated that residue so it could not bind DNA, then, then it was no longer active, indicating it needed to bind DNA was functioning as a transcription factor. And then he also showed that the C terminus uh, was contributing to its activity as well. So we can see then that, that HX is important for forming uh, the memory compartment. Brian also found that it's needed to actually form that pre-memory state and that it's off uh, in the germinal center state. And, and that appears to be at least in part because it is repressed by the germinal center transcription factor BCL6. And so we speculate that the transient downregulation of BCO6 that occurs in some light zone cells may allow some of them to express sufficient HX to uh, move towards a pre-memory state. So we then asked, how does HX promote uh, the pre-memory fate? And so here, Brian uh, sorted uh, um, the memory cells, the early memory cells that are forming uh, during the LCMV response, even though it's reduced numbers, he was able to sort them and compare them to the control. And we can see that there's uh, differential uh, gene expression and um, indicating that these cells uh, haven't taken on the, the normal state. And in particular, they haven't fully downregulated BCL6. I should say they, they certainly have less BCL6 than a germinal center cell, but it's, it's higher than in a, a normal memory cell. And so this then, uh, could explain some of the other differences in gene expression as these are known BCL6 targets. And in particular, we noted that BCL2, which is repressed by BCL6, was underexpressed here. And BCL2, of course, is, is a pro-survival factor. And so we considered whether that low expression might be contributing to the poor development of the memory compartment. And so Brian um, used HX conditional knockout mice using um, Taka Okada's S1PR2 pre-ERT2 mice for conditional ablation of the gene in germinal center cells and could uh, confirm that the importance of HX in memory B cell development. Um, but if he had uh, a BCO2 transgene present, so constitutive BCO2 expression, then there was a uh, strong rescue uh, of the memory cell response. But this doesn't seem like to be the only target that HX has to regulate, whether directly or indirectly. Uh, and another we looked at is a molecule called SKI which is underexpressed here. And SKI is, is a known transcriptional co-regulator. And so using a similar approach, uh, Brian could see that uh, this is the reduced memory formation when HX uh, is absent. But if in those HX deficient cells, he puts uh, in SKI, rescues SKI expression, then he can promote uh, rescue of memory cell development. So finally then in thinking, how, how does um, HX regulate gene expression? we returned to the uh, observation that a second hit in the screen was a molecule called TLE3. Uh, and moreover, uh, Brian had found that when he overexpressed TLE3, just like with HX, he could promote increased uh, memory cell generation. So what is TLE3? This is a co-repressor, a member of the uh, Groucho family of co-repressors that's summarized over here. 
it mediates repression by recruitment uh, of HDACs, but probably also additional mechanisms. Importantly, it lacks its own DNA binding domain, but it can interact with multiple transcription factors via an EH1 motif. And this is a structure of, of a TLE uh, bound to an EH1 motif peptide. Uh, and notably, the EH1 motif was originally identified in a Drosophila homeo domain proteins uh, in Grailed uh, and, and Gusicoid. And hopefully you're remembering that the H uh, in HX stands for, for homeo domain. And so um, we wondered whether HX contained uh, an EH1 motif. And indeed, in mouse HX, we can see that there is a fully conserved motif in the N-terminus. And this had been noted before uh, in human HX and shown to support interaction with uh, TLE1, another family member. So we asked whether HX could interact with TLE3 by generating um, recombinant HX and, and in vitro translated flag TLE3. And we can see that wild type HX could pull down TLE3, but the EH1 motif mutant was very defective in that regard. And so um, finally, Brian asked whether this uh, affected memory development. And so we can see again, wild type promotes memory development when overexpressed, but if it has an EH1 motif mutation is unable to bind TLE3 it's completely defective. So uh, if we put it in the context of this general model of co-repressor function, then we uh, can say that we've got HX in pre-memory cells uh, being recruited to, to target genes, recruiting in TLE3, which can then uh, be bringing in HDAX and, and controlling gene expression. And so to, to summarize this part uh, in, in a model, um, well, first of all, I'll, I'll say that memory B cells tend to be uh, lower affinity than plasma cells when they're generated in a germ center response according to studies by a number of groups. And so in thinking about the signals that are taking place in, in a light zone germ center B cell, a number of studies now indicate that if the cell gets very strong signals, uh, strong T cell help and probably other signals, that will drive strong MYC and mTOR expression and BCL6 will be low. And that state will then favor re-entry into the dark zone if IRA4 becomes dominant, that will then favor a plasma cell fate. Whereas uh, if FOXO1 is turned on, it can cooperate with re-expressed BCO6 to promote the, the dark zone state. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, if there's really minimal uh, signaling, that the cell is really not binding antigen, BCO6 uh, may remain high in the light zone state and the cell may undergo cell death. What we speculate is that in an intermediate level of signaling, there may be a partial down regulation of BCO6 allowing some derepression of HX, which can then recruit TLE3 and mediate possibly further repression of BCL6, allowing derepression of BCL2, cooperation of other factors such as SKI in promoting pre-memory and then memory cell development. So certainly a lot more to do here and, and um, working out the mechanism of HX function is something that, that Brian uh, will be continuing uh, soon in his own lab that he's about to start at, at Washington University. So uh, just pulling back uh, in, in our last slide here, um, thinking uh, about our general interest in cell-cell communication and immune system. I think we all know that multicellularity depends on continual communication between cells. And I would posit that immune cells need to know each cell type in the body that they come in contact with. And our understanding of how each type of immune cell knows where it is and who it's interacting with is incomplete. Multiple communication systems, receptor ligand pairs, still remain to be defined. Uh, and increasingly, as I think I've highlighted, we recognize that the crosstalk involves metabolites and not just proteins. We also know, and we, we heard uh, Yasmin Belkade uh, elegantly present, uh, that the crosstalk between immune cells and commensal self must be integrated into this understanding because it's, it's, it's a huge uh, amount of communication that uh, is going on. And then we've also heard talks in this series uh, from Daniel Mashida and, and also Hai Chi highlighting the crosstalk between the nervous system and the immune system. And I think that these two principal environmental sensing systems are undergoing extensive communication, but our understanding of that crosstalk is still in its infancy. So I think advances, I mean, it's an exciting time um, that, uh, that advances in spatial single cell technologies in microscopy in mass spectrometry and in cell engineering mean that we're entering a new phase of deciphering cellular communications to achieve uh, a comprehensive understanding of the crosstalks necessary for maintaining health and fighting disease. And so um, with that, I'd like to again thank uh, the people who, who've done this work. Uh, 
I've tried to highlight people along the way. These, these are the people who contribute to the newer work that I presented uh, and many uh, important collaborators and critical funding. And, and then finally, um, since this is it's a global talk, I, I'd also like to recognize the, the sister lab, Global Diaspora. So these are all people uh, who've trained in the lab who now um, are on faculty positions uh, at universities uh, around the world or, or scientists uh, in the biotech sector. You can see that we, we do have a, a rather strong preference for the west coast of the US, but, but we have representation across the US, uh, in Canada, in the UK, Europe, Israel, China, Japan, Singapore, and Australia. And I'd really like to, to thank all these, um, these past trainees, many of them many years ago, but, but for uh, th their work with me, but also just for the amazing work that they uh, continue to do. And, and really conclude by saying that, that I look forward to, to working with an even more diverse uh, community of scholars uh, in the future. So thank you. That was amazing, Jason. Thank you so, so much. A spectacular talk. Uh, thank you so much for your effort to prepare the talk and, and for your really inspiring work. Very, very, very nice. Um, so before ending, I'll go, we'll share my screen. And so to remind everyone that uh, we will be doing the questions and answer uh, via Twitter. And uh, so just can you confirm you can see the screen? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, remember uh, questions and answer via Twitter, uh, three easy steps, uh, search for the account Global Immuno Talks, find the tweet that says ask questions for Dr. Jason's sister seminar here, and then reply uh, to that tweet and mentioning hashtag Global Immuno and also uh, the account uh, Immuno Speaker, that is the account that Jason will be using to answer the, the questions. And uh, so with that, uh, we will uh, thank Jason again and uh, we'll uh, look forward to the next Global Immuno Talk uh, with uh, Kate Fitzgerald from UMass. Uh, thank you so much and uh, see you next Wednesday.